Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm doing the book of 2 Corinthians. I think it's a pretty deep, deep book to really study and to really understand because it goes into the depths of Paul's ministry. And as, as we know, he was called to be an apostle. So it's really the depths of apostleship. Sometimes we misunderstand exactly what an apostle goes through and what the purpose of an apostle is. So I think, I think we need to take a little sidestep now. And what I would like to do is read a chapter in a very, very wonderful book. And you, I think you can get this book on a Christian Literature Crusade. It's called Reese Howe's Intercessor. And this is about the intercession of great men that uh, have stood in the gap and been intercessors. And Reese Howe certainly was an intercessor for World War II, probably why we have had the freedom uh, to, to preach the gospel around the world at this time. It's because of his intercession. This is a wonderful book. You need to get it. It's written by Norman Grubb, and of course he was my mentor, so I definitely do love it. But there are so many people that have... Um, passed out this book because it's like the final word on intercession. Now there's a chapter in this book called What is an Intercessor? And I think that's that would be great to read right now. So what I would like to do is read part of this chapter. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read part of it to give you all the flavor or the deeper meaning really of what intercession is, what it means to be a called person what it means to suffer the agony of that calling, and then what it means to have the authority of that very calling. And that certainly is what Paul had. And what he's really trying to identify in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5 and 6. So I thought this fit pretty well. So I thought I would read it. And it's chapter 12, verse um, uh, page 81 in this book. Reese House Intercessor. Be sure to get this book. You will not be disappointed. Um, God seeks intercessors, but seldom finds them. In, uh, uh, is plain from the pain of his explanation through Isaiah. Quote, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. And his protest of disappointment through Ezekiel I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, but I found none. So God is forever looking for intercessors, one's chosen vessels. Now remember Paul's calling in um, Acts chapter 9. He, uh, God, uh, it, he, it was told to Ananias after, before Ananias laid hands on Paul and he received the Holy Spirit, he became Paul. He moved from being Saul to Paul. And he said, he's a chosen vessel unto me. And I'm going to show him the great things that he is going to have to suffer for my sake. He's called to the Gentiles. Wow. So, so you see, this great apostle was a chosen vessel. And he was, he was going to suffer great things. Well, he's bringing out some of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians. Greater than any of the other letters that he has written. And here he is writing this explanation to the Corinthians, who, who, who he calls carnal. Carnal. They're yet carnal, you see. They're still fleshly minded. They're still more concerned about themselves and their own well-being than they are the well-being of others, you see. So they haven't even matured into sonship or fatherhood level, which is really the apostle level. So, uh, but God is interested in and looking for people to stand in the gap. Well, at this point in the Old Testament, he couldn't find a man. So he sent his own man, the man Christ Jesus, is who he sent, his own son. So let me finish reading. Perhaps believers in general have regarded intercession as just some form of rather intensified prayer. Well, I think that's true. We always think of intercession as just prayer. Well, as this book says, it is so long as there is great emphasis on the word intensified. Wow. For there, are though, for, for there are three things to be seen in an intercessor, 
which are not necessarily found in ordinary prayer. Number one, identification. Number two, agony. Number three, authority. Wow. The identification of the intercessor with the one for whom he intercedes is perfectly seen in the Savior, in the Savior's life. Of, of him, it is said that he, his, he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. As a divine intercessor inter interceding for a lost world, he drained the cup of our lost condition to its final and last drop. He tasted death for every man. To do that, in the fullest possible sense, he sat where we sit. By, being, by taking our nature upon himself, by learning obedience through the things that he suffered, by being tempted in all points, like as we are, by, by becoming poor for others' sake, for our sake, and finally, by being made sin for us, he gained the position in, in which, with the fullest authority as the captain of our salvation, made perfect through suffering, and the fullest understanding of all we go through, he could ever live to make intercession for us, and by effective pleading with the Father, is able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. Identification is thus the first law of the intercessor. Okay, law is how a thing works here. It's not like the legalism that we often think of law as being. He just means that it's the first principle of intercession. That identification is the first principle. He pleads effect effectively because he gives his life for those he pleads for. He is their genuine representative. He has submerged his self he has submerged his self interest in interest in their needs and suffering, and as, and as far as possible, has literally taken their place. Now that's identification. That's what Jesus did for us, the great intercessor. So this gives us a, a perfect example of what intercession is and what Paul is talking about, because intercession now is given to the chosen vessels, the ones that God chooses, like he did Paul. And that's what Paul really is bringing out in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There, are, there is another intercessor. So I always say there's two intercessors in, in, in the Bible. One is Jesus. Now this is all in Romans 8. He's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. But there's another intercessor. Now that's what this is talking about now. And in him we see the agony of this, inter, of this ministry. For he is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also is the intercessor. So I always say there's two intercessors in Romans 8. The Holy Spirit inside of us in agony and Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Two intercessors. Okay, let me read it again. There is another intercessor and in him we see the agony of this, of this inter ministry. For he, the Holy Spirit, makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. This one the only present intercessor on earth. You see, we um, are intercessors, but actually we're co-intercessors. He's the real intercessor. He's the one laying his burdens on us. Has no hearts upon which he can lay his burdens and no bodies through which he can suffer and work except the hearts and bodies of those who are his dwelling place. That means us, the body of Christ. Through them, he does his intercessory work on earth, and they become intercessors by reason of the intercessor within them. It is real life in which he calls them, the very kind of life in lesser measure which the Savior himself lived on the earth. Okay, it has to be in less, lesser measure. Why? Because we can't, we can't take the subs, we're, we can't, our intercession never substitutes for sin. There was only one that can do that. And I think 
Norman is bringing this out in the next paragraphs or two. But before the Holy Spirit can lead a chosen vessel into such a life of intercession, he, he first has to deal to the bottom with all that is natural. Now this is what might be still natural in us. What? Love of money? Personal ambition, whether it's religious or even ministry-minded, personal ambition, natural affection, that's family life, for parents and loved ones. That's why that it says in Luke, unless we hate father, mother, sister, and yea, even our own selves, we cannot even be his disciple, it says. Uh, the appetites of the body. The love of life itself, it says, uh, Romans, cha um, Revelations chapter 12 says, We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto death. Now this is an intercessor. All that makes even a converted man live unto himself for his own comfort or advantage, for his own advancement, even for his own circle of friends, my goodness, the Lord is going to put a cross even to your own circle of friends, maybe your own fellowship. Has, all this has to go to the cross. Wow. Wow. This is, you know, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that he suffered the loss of all things, all things, yea, even his own life. Wow, he suffered the law of all things. And Jesus said, unless you lose your life, you're not going to find his life of, sac of sacrifice. It's really a sacrificial life. It is no theoretical death, but a real crucifixion with Christ, such as only the Holy Ghost himself can make actual in the experience of his servants. But as a, both as a crisis and a process, Paul's testimony makes, must be made ours. What is Paul's testimony? Quote, I have been and still am crucified with Christ. This is the verse we always use in Galatians. It's Galatians 2.20. The self must be released from itself to become the agent of the Holy Spirit. Wow. As crucifixion proceeds, intercession begins by inner by inner burdens by calls to outward obediences the spirit begins to live his own life of love and sacrifice for a lost world through his cleansed vessels we see it in reese howe's life we see it at his greatest height in the scripture watch moses the young intercessor leaving the palace by free choice to identify himself with his slave brethren. See him accompanying them through the waste and howling wilderness. See him reach the very summit of intercession when the wrath of God was upon them for their idolatry and their destruction was imminent. This is after he gave them the, Holy, uh, the Ten Commandments and they had already built a golden calf. It was not his body, it was not Moses' body. He now offers for them as intercessor, but his immortal soul, quote, if thou wilt forg forgive their sin, in other words, this is what Moses said, if you won't forgive their sin, and if you won't, then blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. Wow. Moses was saying, if you can't deliver them, if you can't save them, then blot me out. In other words, send me to hell. And he actually called this making an atonement for them. So see, wow. So there is a place for intercession like Jesus' intercession. Not that we could ever take the place for sin. Only Jesus, only the Son of God could do that. But now, now this book, Reese House Intercessor, goes into the Apostle Paul's life, and that's what we're studying in 2 Corinthians. See the Apostle Paul, the greatest man of the new dispensation, as Moses was of the old. His years, for years his body 
through the Holy Ghost is a living sacrifice that the Gentiles might have the gospel. Finally, his immortal soul is offered on the altar. The very one who was just rejoicing with the Romans that nothing could separate him and them from the love of God, that's Romans 8, that's the end of Romans 8, says in a, a moment later, the Spirit bears me witness that he could wish myself accursed, separated from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul says that in Romans 9, 1. He had just finished Romans 8. We've quoted Romans 8 as Christians. Nothing can separate us. No tribulation, no angel. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Paul turns right around in Romans chapter 9 and says, But I wish that I would, my soul would be accursed, that I would really go to hell if my brethren could not be saved, you see kinsmen according to the flesh. He was talking about the, his Jewish brothers. This is an intercessor in action. When the Holy Spirit really lives his life as a chosen vessel, there, there is no limits to the extreme to which he will take him in his passion to warn and save the lost. Isaiah, the aristocrat, had to go naked and barefooted for three years to, to warn Israel. Can you even imagine that? Naked and barefooted for three years to warn Israel. Wow, that, we, can, we can hardly take that in. Hosea had to marry a harlot to show his people that the heavenly husband was willing to take back his adulterous bride. Wow, read Hosea and see that. He had to take her back two or three times. Jeremiah was not allowed to marry as a warning to Israel against the terror and tragedies of captivity. And they did go into captivity. They never believed Jeremiah. They threw him into a uh, well. They would not believe him when he said, Surrender yourself to Nebuchadnezzar. This is God. God is sending Nebuchadnezzar down to take you captive. Ezekiel was not allowed to shed one tear for the death of his wife who he called the desires of his eyes. He absolutely adored his wife. And God took her, and he was not allowed to shed one tear. What? Wow. And so the list might be continued. Every, uh, every greatly used instrument of God has been, in, in his measure, an intercessor. Wesley, for backslidden England. Booth, for the down and trodden. Hudson Taylor for China. C.T. Studd for the unevangelized world. And I would say Norman Grubb to, great, to bring the great truths of uh, Christ living in us with no independent self. That was his intercession that he brought to the Christian world. And he died bringing that to the Christian world. But intercession is more than the Spirit sharing his groanings with us and living his life of sacrifice for the world through us, it is the Spirit gaining his ends of abundant grace. If the intercessor knows identification and agony, he also knows authority. Wow. If you've been called and you've paid a price, you've got the authority. You've gained the position in the Spirit. It is the law, and, it, and this is scripture in John, that the corn of wheat um, and, and the harvest, it is the law of the corn of wheat and the harvest. The corn of, corn of wheat goes into the ground and dies, but it has a harvest. Because if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So, you see, if you've paid a price and stood in a gap, <laughs> and you wonder how, why in the world, you see, now you have the authority for change, and you take that authority. You take that authority over Satan's hold on people. Maybe, you know, maybe even some of your family are held in, um, uh, in blindness and in sins, really. Now, you take authority over Satan, and in, in, in if, you've, if you've been called to that place, you take authority over him because you have the authority now to absolutely um, rebuke him 
and uh, deliver your family. And that's exactly what happened to me. Intercession is not substitution for sin. Now, that's, here's, here's where this comes in. Jesus, you can't do it for sins, but you do it for sin's consequences. Okay? There are other... There are only ever has ever been one substitute for the world's for the world of sinners jesus the son of god but intercession so identifies the intercessor with the sufferers that he gives him a prevailing place with god he moves god he even causes him to change his mind can you even imagine that you see god has declared the wages of sin is death okay that's that's declared god has declared that. He can't go back on his word. However, an intercessor, that's why he's looking for an intercessor. He does not want to uh, declare uh, death and judgment on us. He wants to show forth his mercy. That's why he sends, he's looking for intercessors to stand in the gap. He wants to show forth his mercy. He wants us to change his mind, actually. And an intercessor can do that with the authority that we have, you see. He even causes, an intercessor even causes God to change his mind. Moses could do it. God was going to destroy the people, destroy the Israelites, and Moses changed his mind. Well, you see, we can too. Isaiah did it. Ezekiel did it. Well, we're New Testament. These were Old Testament. We're New Testament intercessors. How much more can we change God's mind? God gains his objective, or rather the Spirit gains it through him, through the intercessor. Thus Moses, by intercession, became the Savior of Israel and pre prevented their destruction. And we can have little doubt that Paul's extreme act of intercession for God's chosen people, that's the Jews, results, resulted in the great revolution given, revelation given him at that time of worldwide evangelization and the final salvation of Israel. That's Romans 11 and 10. If you haven't read Romans 11 and 10, you can see that Paul saw in the future, he prophesied in Romans 11 and 10, he prophesied the great revelation that was going to come to the Jewish people and the worldwide evangelization of them. Now, now the book is about Reese Howe's intercessor, uh, Reese Howe's, and he was an intercessor. He lived in Wales, and he, like I said earlier, he interceded during World War II. Oh, this is a great, great book to read, and I, I really encourage you to send off a Worldwide Evangelization Crusade, or CLC, actually, CLC um, uh, Bookstore, and you will be able to purchase this book, Reese Howe's Intercessor. Uh, um, this is Christian Literature Crusade is the name of it. Mr. Howe's would often speak of the gain position of intercession, and the truth of it is obvious on many occasions in his life. And, uh, uh, and it goes on to show many of the different occasions that he interceded for and how he had authority. And if you get this book, you will be greatly blessed because it will teach you, yes, that intercession is, is really different, is more powerful than just prayer. Now, prayer is powerful. It says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We know that. But sometimes things are so hardened and so impossible that God needs an intercessor. If the intercessor does not stand in the gap, the person is going to be judged. And so he needs for uh, uh, you to stand in the gap. Now, I have a friend, and uh, I have some stories of intercessions of people uh, that have stood in the gap in my book, The Treasures of Darkness. And I, I've written a chapter called Intercession. And also, there's a story in here of a friend of mine. It's an anonymous story because... She really doesn't want her family to find this out yet. But this great friend of mine has stood in, in the gap for her family. And I can tell you they have totally misunderstood her. Her, her, her mother and father were great Christian people. And uh, her family, her three sisters, were all great Christian people. But every one of them misunderstood her and thought she was really 
a heretic because she believed that Christ lived in her. And she, she stood, she never backed off of knowing that Christ really lived in her and he was her life. And because of it, her family rejected her because of that. And not only that, her husband also rejected her for many other reasons, not for the spiritual reason, but for many other reasons. And he had many affairs and God would not let her leave him. And she stood in faith for him and her children and her family. And God has given her great authority over the demons that have ruled her family and the generational sins that have ruled in her family for years. And he has given her the authority. Now, he called her to it years ago. She suffered. She suffered greatly. But she's not suffered in uh, why is this happening to me and why am I in but with self-pity. I mean, it, she, it would be so common to feel sorry for yourself and want some kind of release. And certainly we do want a release from what's happening to us and from the pain of it. But you see, Jesus, the inner man that lives within us, Jesus, the real life that we live from, is the victory even to stand in those places. And the Holy Spirit has laid this intercession, intercession on her, and she could not shake herself for it, from it. And now God has given her great authority to release, release her family. Her mother's already passed on into the heavenlies, and her father, her sisters, releasing her sisters, also her immediate family. And she tells me that she believes the intercession that she's had is not just for her family, but all of the city for which she lives. Wow. And see her, she's just a little woman that lived, that doesn't go out evangelizing, and yet God has uh, made her an intercessor for her whole city. Now, just recently, I've been to that city, and there is revival breaking out in that city, and it's a small town in Virginia, and um, but yet... Um, there, there's new light coming in that town all the time, and we believe it's really, it's based on the fact that she has paid the price, and now she has the authority to uh, change God's mind of judgment, because the wages of sin is death, it's judgment. But yet God wants us to change his mind, and so that he can have mercy. And now he has mercy on her very town that she lives in. Now I believe the same thing for myself in the city that I live in. And now we are taking authority over the, the demonic, um, really angelic beings that have, have held these cities in bondages. And we can take authority over that because of our intercessory price that we have paid. And so uh, we just thank God that he has chosen us to be a vessel to do such a mighty work. However, you know, we don't take that lightly and it's not a light thing. It's not something that we you know, lightly go into. It, you, are, you are actually called by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit puts you through the agony, and He also then gives you uh, the authority to gain the intercession. So that's really what intercession is, and um, so Paul certainly lived that life of an intercessor. So thank you for joining me today, and may God richly bless you, and may God bring to your understanding the fullness of what intercession really means in your life. Thank you. Goodbye.